Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash genre. Over 180,000 titles to choose from from your iPhone, Android, or Kindle. That's audibletrial.com forward slash G-E-N-R-E. Weirdo bookworms unite! We want to share our love of genre fiction with you. Fans of horror, sci-fi, fantasy, and more can stop by as we chat about what we've been reading. Hi, genre junkies, and welcome to Fantasy Night. Hey, genre junkies. I'm Scott. I'm Sandra. So, Scott, what's new? What's, what's happening? What's exciting in your life? So, I got a new car. Yay! A new-to-you car. A new-to-me car. We're a Prius family now. I'm so happy you joined me in the drinking the Prius Kool-Aid. I love Pri-I so much, and now we just need to get Stitches a Roomba. <laughs> we'll just be an all-electric all family. I love it so much. Um, it'd be so adorable. But besides that, you look good? Feeling good? I'm feeling great. So before we get started, I wanted to talk about another fantasy book I've read recently uh, that Scott didn't read. And that is The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. Um, This book has a huge amount of hype around it. It was one of my most anticipated reads for 2018. And I kind of decided this might sound bad, but I knew Scott was not going to really enjoy this book once I started reading it. Um, And that's not to say that he doesn't like a lot of, you know, these type of books. But I just knew I was like, this isn't going to be the book for him. So I just want to talk about this one on my own for a little bit because it's so exciting and a lot of people are just really, really into this book or looking forward to reading it right now. So my sister Amanda, friend of the show Amanda, who you all know and love, uh, she's reading The Cruel Prince right now. And I wouldn't be surprised if maybe when the next book comes out in this, I don't know if it's a trilogy, duology, what it is, if we do a little recap on it. But I just kind of wanted to put my, you know, official genre junkies opinion out there about it. Um, I really liked the book. I thought it was beautifully written. Um, I'm pretty much obsessed with Holly Black as a writer and as a person now. I totally love her. Uh, she really is the queen of the fairies. Uh, she has such a beautiful way of writing about the fae. And this book has a really cool kind of contemporary twist on it. That's not a spoiler because the book opens with the lead character, June, and her two sisters being kidnapped in present time. It's, you know, a few years ago and getting transported into the world of fairy. So they lived a large chunk of their lives in the human world. Now they're in the fairy world and they're dealing with fairy court drama. And where do they fit in and where do they belong and what is their fate to be there? Um, And I really liked that concept. As I said, it's a beautiful, lushly written book. There was a few character things, a few character choices that I wasn't crazy about, but I can tell that um, Holly put those in there in order to give these young characters room to grow. Uh, So I'm very fascinated. I'm very happy. And I would officially say, if you like fantasy, if you like fairies, you got to pick up The Cruel Prince. Well, that's very cool. I'm sad that I wouldn't like it, but... Well, maybe... Okay, let me rephrase that. I think that you should maybe revisit it closer to when the next book is coming out. Okay. Yeah, because I think for you, this is going to be one of those where you're going to want to read the next book right away in order to flesh out your feelings on some of that character stuff. Yeah, I don't always do well with first books when I have to wait for the second. Speaking of... That brings us to tonight's episode, which is Furyborn by Claire Legrand. So this was an arc that we received, and let me tell you a little bit about it. Riel Dardenne and Eliana Farakora live a thousand years apart, but their fates are intertwined. In the past, Riel must endure brutal trials to prove she is the Sun Queen, a savior, part of an ancient prophecy, and not the dreaded Blood Queen, the Destroyer. Eliana is a ruthless bounty hunter serving the Empire. She seems untouchable until tragedy strikes and the course of her life changes forever. That's a really great synopsis, as always, from you, Sandra. Oh, thank you. I work really hard on these synopses for like five minutes before we record. <laughs> it's, it's very, very well thought out. 
Well, I always want to keep people a little interested. I want to, um, you know, like cast out my line and like set the bait, but I don't want to like give it all away. Yep. So, Scott, I'm going to let you start us off with your experience score on this book. All right. Well, um, Fury Born was a really odd ramp up. I had some real trouble getting into it, but um, I started getting into a real groove and it was a really good read until about halfway through the book. And then I just started to fly through the pages. Uh, Finally, by the end, I can honestly say I was obsessed, completely obsessed. And and that's the score I'm ultimately going to give it. But it it really took me a while to get there with this book, which is not common for me. So this was a little bit almost of a slow burn for you for a while. It really was, especially the very first quarter of the book. There's a lot of world building and a lot of character building. And I had a lot of trouble getting connected to the characters at the very beginning of the book. Once I did, I started to enjoy it. And then once the real meat of the story happened about halfway through, that's when I just started just flipping, 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 reading as fast (laughs) as I could. That makes me really happy to hear. I wasn't sure where you were going to land ultimately with this book. Um, For me, I'm going to cut straight to the chase. This was an obsession for me. I was obsessed. Um, Maybe not surprisingly, if you know me, uh, this is just a dark, beautiful fantasy. Um, It's even got some gore in it and like blood and stuff. I just found it lush and inviting. Absolute obsession. I am not surprised in the least that you gave this an obsession score. Talking about young adult literature is not for the faint of heart. There's fashion atrocities, queer subtext, problematic love interests. And that's just for a start. But never fear, because Carrie and Marie are here with Go Your Own YA, a podcast about the young adult literature you never knew you loved. Do something good for yourself and bad for the patriarchy and find us wherever pods are cast. So let's talk a little bit more about the story and the writing style that Legrand presented in Fury Born. Yeah, so this book goes back and forth between about a thousand year span. So crazy. I, That's it's so crazy. I love it. it it's, it's very interesting, but, uh, I, you know, I've seen it before and I don't think that this book does it as well as some other books have. Oh. So the, the basic conceit of it is that you have Riel in the past who has created these events. She is thought to be one of these future queens uh, prophesized in prophecy. (laughs) Yeah, a whole lot of prophecy going on. Prophets. And then on the other end, a thousand years later, you have Eliana, who, let's see, how far do I want to go with this? There's definitely something going on with Eliana. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back and forth from chapter to chapter of what happened a thousand years ago and what is happening now, or what's happening now versus what's happening a thousand years in the future, it never really gets a grasp on that, which I actually think is a strong choice. Yes. She didn't try to, I feel, shoehorn too much into this. There's, um, I believe this is a trilogy? I, it is a trilogy, yes. Right. And um, I appreciate, you know, sometimes books feel rushed or sometimes they feel kind of filler. And I feel like this one... She told a really good, compelling amount of story for a first book. I think there was a whole lot of story packed into that book. And it's not a it's not a short book. It's not long. It's not, you know, Terry Goodkind long. Mm-hmm. It's but it's it, it is definitely a fantasy epic. It's epic length. Yeah, it's epic fantasy. And for me, I, I guess at my obsessive rate, I was devouring it. I just I wanted more and more. It didn't feel long to me at all. I didn't feel like there was a lot of, you know, kind of gunk in the middle or anything. And see, for me, I found the first half to be very long for me. I don't want to say that it dragged on, but uh, part of the problem is I was reading this on Kindle, Mm -hmm. on my phone specifically, and in the bottom left-hand corner, it said, okay, seven and a half hours left in this book. Now, it does a pretty good job of guessing my reading speed, and that's not my typical reading time for a book. (laughs) So- I already had kind of an instant reaction of, oh, this is going to be a big one, which is fine. But I really did have a lot of trouble. And to be honest, throughout the entire book with the way that it bounced back and forth. 
Oh, now you see some people do have problems with different perspectives in books, and especially since these are two characters that are seemingly unrelated to us as the reader and quite a distance of time apart. For me, it was the time difference that got me. I'm okay with reading different perspectives, but I feel that when you're going to do a jump between perspectives, particularly when you're doing a jump between time, there needs to be specific reveals that are given to you between the two. Something that happens in this chapter immediately informs this next chapter that happens a thousand years in the future. And there's so very little of that in this book. Oh my gosh, I am like shaking my head violently because I so disagree. That is actually one of the things I loved about this book because I felt like even though the two plot lines were unrelated and different time periods, I felt like each one perfectly set up the next. It was like, in my mind, it was like a little domino, like tick, tick, tick and I could just see them all falling into place. That's so funny that you had such a different reaction to that than I did. That is really interesting because, I mean, clearly you saw that you you were able to see specific setups for things that were happening between the two chapters outside of a few moments that were, quite frankly, hinted at in the very first chapter. Most of it just kind of, okay, let's put it this way. I wish that this was two books. Hmm. I wish that there was the story of Riel and the story of Eliana. No. Nope. And I'd be okay if it on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, or, shut you down. No. Nope. Or even better, I wish that it was done in sections, not chapter by chapter switching back and forth, but you had maybe kind of Lord of the Rings style. You have four books in the book. So the first quarter of the book is Riel. Second is Eliana. Third is Riel, fourth is Eliana. I I would have done better with more of an act structure instead of a back and forth. Oh man, I am like, I cannot believe my ears right now. I I just, I am not seeing what you're seeing at all. I'm like, no, what are you talking about? I loved the flip-flopping. Like I said, for me, it really set up the next girl's narrative really well. I found like the chapters were the perfect length too to keep me reading because I wasn't ever tired of either perspective. So I was just so excited to keep going. And I felt like they were really well set up. And there's always a a quote at the start of every chapter. And it's like a thesis statement for the chapter you're about to read. Yes, absolutely. Really cool. I, I have to say, the chapter intros, the quotes, and the historical documents, yeah. I felt did a great job of setting up the world oh, better was, than the yeah. previous chapter did. And, and I, I have to say, I have to agree with you. The chapter length uh-huh. was excellent. It was very snappy, very quick. Yes. Uh, it gave you a really exciting pace Yes. For the most part, when it came to the length of the chapter, something happens and then you, you know, it's it's like a television show next time on. Right. But it wasn't like annoying, like, oh, my God, I can't believe I have to wait. It was like just the right amount of, oh, I'm so excited to read this, but I'm also super excited to get back to the other storyline, the other timeline. But in the beginning of the book, those chapters, I don't know if they're a little bit longer, if they feel a little bit longer. There's not as much that happens, so that pacing doesn't quite fit in the very beginning of the book. It definitely picks up and catches its wind towards the end. So a little bit more about why I loved this book so much, and it was so um, much of an obsession for me. Uh, This book felt fierce. It was fresh, and it was gloriously feminist to me. Um, There's fantasy tropes in here that were utilized in very inventive ways. And I never mind fantasy tropes, because most fantasy, you're going to have them. You have the hero's journey cycle, and you have, you know, characters that fill this role in that niche, and, you know, like the trial or the the big thing they have to get or accomplish. I mean, that's what makes it the genre that it is. Absolutely. But I felt um very fresh when I read this book because of the world she created. I love this world. I love the history. I love the backstory, which we'll talk about more in the spoilers, but it was just very inventive to me. I really did like the world. I didn't find it quite as inventive as you did. Oh. Uh, so I, 
I'll just talk about the setting for a moment. Okay. There's a lot of ideas in there that are very reminiscent of previous ideas in fantasy. It doesn't really sure. reinvent the wheel when it comes to its magic system, when it comes to a lot of its mythology, with one exception, which I think we'll go into in the spoiler section. I think so, too, because it's so good, but it's not fleshed out very much early in the book. So I want to save it for the spoiler section. But I will say it does have a very, I agree with your statement of it feeling fresh and mm -hmm. powerful and feminist. Good. Uh, at every opportunity, Legrand subverts expectations on how a female character is portrayed. Yes. Especially and most notably in their interactions with each other. Yes. I think that's a very keen observation, Scott. And I think that that was very powerful and very memorable about this book. And I think that it's very important because of that. So one other thing I love about this book that's going to lead us into characters. I was so pleased with the diversity representation in this book. There's people who are described with fair skin, brown skin, tan skin, ebony skin. So not only are we like, we're good on that, <laughs> which is wonderful, especially in fantasy, because sometimes it gets very... um like European heavy and everybody just feels very white. <laughs> but um, which I definitely felt that at the beginning when, you know, the main characters are all white with brunette hair. But you're well, right. It, that's it, actually up to interpretation with some of those characters. OK. Yeah. Um, which is one thing I like is she does leave some interpretation for you to paint the picture of what this individual and their skin tone looks like. I think that's fair. After falling on my face with head on, I think I will I will give that to you. Well, okay, we both missed something on that. Maybe we should talk about that. Maybe we'll we'll bring that into the spoiler section because right. that's a past episode. Um, but another thing that oh just pleased me so much in this book was the grand's treatment of sexuality. Okay. There are really <laughs> no characters that are like fully anything it is implied that both riel and eliana though they have male love interests have been with females actually it's blatantly said that they've been with females or that they've had fantasies about females and there's also some just straight up um homosexual characters too and i was so incredibly pleased with this I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was not only inclusive, but it was just very progressive that um, she didn't feel the need to, even though her lead females have opposite gender love interests, she didn't pigeonhole them into, well, they're just cis hetero and that's it. They can't even think about someone of their own gender. And I can't pretend that I know every single horrible trope that is that exists around queer characters. Mm -hmm. But of the ones that I know, I did not see Legrand fall into any of the traps. Absolutely. I would agree, too. And of course, you know, people who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community might have seen or noticed or feel differently. But for me, from my perspective, I f was very happy to read about more um, inclusive and diverse characters. I was like, I, I was just floored by that, especially in a book that is technically young adult. This book is considered young adult? Yes. But, I don't know if I would put it in that category. Well, there's actually some pretty descriptive um, sex stuff that goes in. So this kind of reminds me of the Sarah J. Mass uh, Court of Thorns and Roses book, where it's like, um, maybe it's more new adult fantasy i mean all of this marketing stuff is so silly and it gets so confusing because like you know maybe some people in the young adult world aren't ready for the fairly graphic sex that goes on but i thought it was tasteful and compelling that's the perfect word it's very tastefully and um it's like cl i don't know classy it's classy yeah. Not that I don't enjoy smutty or sleazy things on occasion, but this was very classy. <laughs> so let's uh, talk a little bit more about our characters as we know them uh, without any spoilers. So Riel is the one in the past who is going through these trials. Um, I really liked Riel. I had a very positive response to Riel. She has this secret 
that she's lived with her whole life, and it's made her feel in some ways a stranger, even to those who are closest to her. And there was something about that that really made me invest in her character. I also like that she is um, kind of cheeky. She doesn't mind speaking her mind, but sometimes it gets her in a little bit of trouble. But she's very smart, and she has um, a really warm, loving presence to her as well. Without being like, I don't know, without making me want to gag. I really liked Riel from the very beginning. Part of what made me feel like I wanted this to be two books is because I didn't want to keep being pulled away from Riel. Aww. Her character is so strong and intelligent. And hmm, she's not flawed. I don't want to say she's flawed, but she has real motivations and real drawbacks. Mm hmm. And I really appreciated that character. She's very lovable from the very beginning. Yeah, she really is. And keeping in her timeline, uh, another important character in her section of things is Audric, who is one of uh, the trio of her and another character, Lou Devine. Uh, they're like these childhood friends and, you know, could be more going on. Uh, Audric, I felt, was very sensitive and very sweet. In a way that you don't always see the lead male princely type. It would have been very easy to make him a very macho ride into battle as the savior sort of male character in fantasy. But mm -hmm. he was really a very multidimensional sensitive character. He had he had emotional depth. Like he cries. <laughs> it's nice. And it's okay. Yeah. And part of with all these characters, this being a first book... There's definitely room to grow for everybody, which is really important to keep in mind, because we know that this story is going to, you know, like span a thousand year period. So it's nice that it's like, OK, everybody's got a little growing room, a little wiggle room to evolve. And Ludivine, who is engaged to Audric. She's the third of that trio. She doesn't have a lot to do in the first half of the book, so I don't want to go too deeply into her character, but I really like her as a character. Again, she is a unique, strong female character in the book that I might have actually ended up being my favorite character in the book. I think that's really sweet that you say that, because I thought someone else was going to be your favorite character. I thought Tal was going to be your favorite character. I love Tal, who is... Uh, Riel's mentor who is Riel's mentor, but he's he very much just fills the mentor role. He actually does not have a very deep character. I really appreciated Ludivine because one of one thing, I love her name. I love that name. Ludivine. Ludivine. I feel myself like saying it all the time, like it's a state of being. I feel very Ludivine right now. But besides that, um, I also sometimes called her Ludvig in my head <laughs> when I read it. And so that was fun. But um, I appreciated her and Riel's friendship. I thought that was a nice female friendship, and I really appreciated it. So in our quote-unquote modern time of the book, Thousand Years in the Future, we have Eliana, the bounty hunter. Eliana, I feel like, was a very well-written character because for me, and maybe for many people, she's not a very likable character. She is not a likable character at all. I appreciate that a lot. I think this might have been on purpose, but at the beginning, Legrand puts her into some of the fantasy tropes for women characters that are sometimes a uh, sometimes a pain point in fantasy where she's talking about her curves, she's talking about her breasts, she's talking about her beauty and her sexuality, which can go a really weird way in fantasy, and it, and it really is a concern. And that immediately made me kind of dislike her because I, I dis, well, because I disliked the way that Legrand was treating her. Now, there is a really great growth and payoff to that. And if you are sensitive to that sort of thing, I do encourage you to continue on because that particular part of her personality is actually handled very well, in my opinion. So one thing that's really kind of cool is that um, Eliana in her career as a bounty hunter utilizes her sexuality. She uses it to get her prize that she's after, um, which is really, 
really pretty cool, I thought, because, you know, she's not just like lovesick all the time or anything like that. Like she just had a lot of different layers and aspects to her. And part of that is that she does sometimes very bad things to people in order to, um, you know, catch her bounty. Uh, she also has a wicked biting sense of humor that I loved. And that's when I knew like, OK, we're going to get along really well because she's pretty darn funny. And she also has, you know, kind of an emotional side to her, a ferocious side to her. I feel like of all the characters we met in this first book, she was probably the most well-rounded of everybody. I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. So she has her best friend, Harkin, who's kind of like her sidekick, which is always cool when it's like a female with like a male sidekick. Um, He's really sweet. And he is one of the characters that supports Eliana and makes her an even better character. I kind of want to talk about him in conjunction with her brother, Remy, for that reason. Who is, once again, we kind of have a type, just an adorable little child. So you know what's funny, speaking of Remy? Did they ever actually say how old he was? No, and thank you, because I forgot to take a note down on this. They never <laughs> describe what he looks like. They never describe his age. I think they say he has like a flop of brown hair or something. And they refer to him as the baker's boy because he is an assistant to a baker, obviously. But at first I was like, are you like six? Are you like 12? It was kind of funny because he kept changing so much in my mind that I'm like, oh my God, like, what are you? I kind of settled on like a preteen. I, I kind of settled at 10 or 11 too. Yeah. I, I think, you know, right at that point where he's starting to become like getting adult thoughts and trying, starting to become like a, like a real big kid, but yeah. still has a lot of that childish wonder. Um, did you like Harkin as well? I like Harkin very much. Yeah. He's um he's another well written male character that has a lot of depth and a lot of emotional maturity. Yes. I shouldn't say he just he and Remy just exist to make Eliana even more awesome than she already is, but they certainly help us understand her general awesomeness. So there's some more characters that we're going to talk about in the spoiler section. But for right now, let's talk about our appeal. All right. Um, so I think that this book definitely fits into niche. <gasps> I, really? I, I just don't see many who aren't already a fan of fantasy and genre fiction in general finding anything for them here. But there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. If you are a fantasy fan, you are pretty sure to love this book if this was limited to just our genre junkie fans all of you will i think will love this book but when it comes to the actual you know world i think this is really just for fantasy fans wow I i'm pretty shocked yet again by your opinion on that um i, I classify this as a broad appeal I mean, obviously, I, I think that you should have some interest in fantasy, but I think if you have some interest in fantasy, you're going to find something that you like about this. I think the kind of traditionalist people are going to feel very comfortable and at home at this with this book. But I also feel that people who are maybe not totally sold on fantasy as their favorite genre, this could be a really cool thing for them to explore because... There's so much going on and there's so much cool character stuff and there's so much, you know, awesome progressive stuff. So, yeah, I'm going to go broad. Well, all right. So read it for yourselves if you haven't already and let us know where you fall on that. But for everybody who has already read the assigned reading, let's go to the spoiler sections. Let's go. Enjoying the show? Please like and subscribe on iTunes. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Genre Junkies. And don't forget to visit the website, genrejunkies.com. Welcome back to the spoiler section of Furyborn by Claire Legrand. So what else can I say besides angels? We have fallen angels. This is something I love. This was huge to me. It was so hard for me to not say in the first section of this podcast. I love the fallen angel thing. I love the angelic wars. I love 
Wraiths. I love Corian Angels. I'm sold. Yum. Delicious. I'm so happy. Oh my gosh. And there's like a monothelistic thing going on because they have like the saints, but then they also have God and they have this weird Pope. I was just floored with the weird spiritual religious stuff going on in this book. Yeah, I really was not expecting the angels to be such a powerful thing. I mean, in the very first chapter, they do talk about angels, but these are literally angelic creatures. These are aliens. These are different. Yeah. And they're written very uniquely as well. They have they have human like motivations, but their their characterizations are very alien. Yes, because it's like maybe they were human at some point. We don't know exactly the backstories of angels like fully. Uh, we know they're basically <laughs> I mean, they're immortal and they might kind of change and evolve at their base. But we don't really know the whole story of angels. And I cannot wait to learn more. So obviously, I mentioned a wraith. That would be Zara. And who is officially my favorite character. She's my second favorite character. I, she's so playful and fun. But she looks all spooky and weird. And she like knows all this stuff. And she has a hard time like, oh, I just I can't put it into words. And it'd be easier if I show you because yeah, they're kind of like these alien beings. She is such your type of character. She really is. I love her. And I think we would be best friends. I want to say something that I that I caught in this book that I can't tell if it's an homage or if this book is secretly part of a different series of books. Oh my God, what is it? What is it? So towards the very end of the book, when when Eliana is escaping from the, the, um, the laboratory, mm-hmm. the lights above her head are described as ambaric light. I, I noticed that. What's okay. that mean? What, that, what, what's this? That's from his dark materials. What? A- ambaric power was electricity in Lyra's Oxford. That's what they referred to as electricity. Is this real life right now? Right. And we're talking about angels. We're talking about time and space. I think that this might be secretly, kind of, (laughs) sort of, part of the Dark Materials series. Oh my gosh. I mean, you think about the, the way that they describe magic, the way that they describe the Imperium as being this golden light and this dust it reminds me so much of dust in his dark materials right there's something very um science meets magic about all this i mean it's kind of you know we couldn't say this in the first part of the episode but i mean really if you're a dark materials fan i think you would enjoy this like you said i don't know if it's really meant to be a spiritual successor to it or anything but it's You know, there's something more going on. There's something with these angels that they know things that they shouldn't know. And not only because they're millennia old, they know about genetics, at least the Corian, at least the emperor does. That's right. So it's like, how do they know that? What are they not telling us? Which is part of the wonderful compulsion to this series for me. Okay, this is one of my crazy harebrained theories, but... Let's maybe, have it. Maybe the angels are from a different universe. Yes. Just like Lyra was from a different universe and traveled to our universe. Multiverse. They're humans yes. from a different universe. And they have science and they have knowledge. Advanced civilization. Exactly. And they came to this world and tried to take it over for themselves. Yes. Maybe out of religious fervor, maybe just out of power hungriness. And okay, they were defeated for a while, but now they're back. Or maybe I'm really just overthinking it and Legrand is a fan of his dark materials and Mm -hmm. wanted to throw in an homage. Either way, I think it's wonderful because I think it's all part and parcel, right? Like it's these kind of um, almost a little genre bending stuff going on. Super cool. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Simon as well. Okay. What do you think of Simon? I liked Simon a lot. It took me an embarrassingly long amount of time to realize that he was the boy from the beginning of the book. Just an embarrassingly long amount of time. Uh, In fact, you were floating a pet theory about Simon, and I had to unfortunately burst your bubble and be like... Oh, yeah. I I said, you know, okay, I just want to throw this out there, because Sandra... Sandra is so good at calling shots in books and movies that every Uh, once in a while, I like to try. 
And I said, okay, I'm just going to call it right now because I knew we were about the same point in the book. And I said, I think Simon is Audric. And I was like, honey, no. Don't you remember? The first the chapter? Yeah, yeah, the boy's name was Simon. I'm like, oh, <laughs> right. I hated bursting his bubble like that. But um, I love the opening chapter of this book so much. I actually went back and read it a couple times throughout the book because... um. As I got to know Riel and Simon more, I felt very um, emotional. I especially feel emotional thinking about Riel because we're seeing this crazy foreshadowing of what she will become and what she's going to do. And it's like right now when she's still kind of in the early throes of it, I just like want to wrap my arms around her and be like, oh, my precious baby. Oh, my precious baby. It's all going to get so crazy for you. Yeah, it's just going to get so much worse from here. I think that this book, because of the first chapter, because it's fantasy and has maps, if you're going to read this as opposed to digest it in an audible format, I think that you should get the physical copy. Did you say audible is in audible.com is in use our code? That's right. Uh, audibletrial.com forward slash genre. Hey, there it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think if you're going to actually read words on a medium, yeah. then I think that you should get the physical copy. Fantasy books tend to be like that because of yeah. the maps alone. Yes. But you're going to find your... Well, okay. I'm talking to you like you haven't read the book already, which you have. <laughs> if you're in this section, I hope. But so anyway, I wish that we had the physical copy because I really wanted to go back to that first page multiple times. I wanted to look at the maps and I didn't have that experience. And yeah. I think that I'm not going to say it damaged my experience with the book overall, but I really wish that I had that. And we will be getting a finished copy, you know, because we did read the arc and it is nice to have a finished copy. And I know that before the next books in the series come out, I'm going to want to revisit this one. Oh, I, I me too. Yeah. So I will say um, a little bit more about Corian real quick, because I love I love me a good villain. And I'm compelled by the villainous side of these angels, because, you know, obviously, wherever they came from, whatever they're doing, they have such potential for good. And we know that there are angels who don't agree with um, the bad angels, the power hungry angels or whatever they are. Um, so Corian is not that, obviously. He is um, abusive and manipulative and a creep, but at the same time, charismatic and alluring and just a lot of stuff going on that makes a villain very meaty. I found it really interesting, particularly when it came to his abuse and his manipulation. That can be a very strong trope for men, especially in fantasy. And I mm -hmm. found it very interesting that the one character that exhibited that trait was not human. I agree. And I like that. Um, I'm very interested in Marx, which is the product of an angel and a human. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I I like that. That's always very interesting in sci-fi and fantasy when you have you know like an overlord and an underling race race wise, but then there's dissenters on either end that come together and make unions. I find that a really interesting plot point. I was really hoping to learn more about his motivations, which are not revealed in the book. Right. Well, and I mean, this has been a long time that he's been reigning, and he is called the Emperor of the Undying, and his people are basically zombie angels. I mean, this is nuts in a wonderful way that doesn't feel completely convoluted when you read it. So really quickly, before we get to the execution score, I have a segue. Second favorite character for me would be the Chevalier Altherion, the winged horse. Oh, well, of course, the God's Beast. Amazing. I was not expecting her to show up. And she was wonderful. She was very cat-like, beautiful. What a wonderful addition to this book. I love the way that, that she's described throughout the book as, a horse, but not quite like a horse. Yeah. You know, cocked her head like a dog in yeah. curiosity, curled up like a cat. Just really, yeah. really interesting creature. 
And I love um, how much she became so dedicated to Riel. And like when she curled up with her and like put her wing around her, I was like, oh my God, that sounds like heaven and I want to be there. So how many giant winged horse creatures out of 10 would you give Furyborn? Oh. How many god beasts out of 10? Can we do it out of five? Let's do god beasts out of five. Okay, out of five. Um, Furyborn is a really hard book for me to score. Um. Because removing the absolutely kick-ass feminism from the equation, I think it has some notable missteps. The pacing is inconsistent, especially at the beginning. Um, outside of the back-and-forth narration, which itself is becoming a bit of an overused trope for me, there's not a lot of originality outside of the angels, which are brilliant and beautiful. But I can't remember reading a book with so many positive, powerful, honest female characters and I feel like that was the number one intention of the author. So I'm going to give it four God's Beasts out of five. I think that is wonderful. And again, um, I agree with you, but like for some different reasons. Um, I too give it four God's Beasts, oh, maybe four and a quarter, maybe four and a quarter God's oh, Beasts. Oh, four God's Beasts, only a quarter of it well, exists. I mean, what just... happened to the other three quarters? What did you do, eat it? <laughs> it's just... Um, it just got a little haircut. I just chopped off the tail. That's the that's the quarter. Or maybe a wing. Just gave me a wing. But um I again found this book feminist, vibrant, beautiful, exciting, uh, dare I say sexy, dangerous, uh, kind of bizarre in a really captivating way. Absolutely could not put it down. Obsession, Claire Legrand. Just go ahead and take my money and send me everything you ever want to write just right now, please. Yeah, I it's going to be a very hard wait for the next book and the book after that. I, I will be reading this whole series. So as a nice little bookend to this episode, Scott and I wanted to talk about something that was brought to our attention about Head On, which is that John Scalzi book we read a few episodes ago. So this has been weighing on me for about a month now. Uh, we had a listener who posted to us and let us know, hey, uh, I think you missed something. So the char the main character in Head On, Chris, is actually never gendered in the book. Amazing. Amazing. Chris, um, they are ungendered. They could be a female. They could be a man. They could be neither. They are just Chris. And they're never referred to anything other than Chris. And I... I think that that's really impressive and it really it really does make me think about how I read the book and how I experienced the book. I feel a little guilty about that whole episode to be honest that we didn't refer to Chris as they that we referred to Chris as he the whole time. Um I agree with you. I feel a little guilty too and kind of in a weird way uh because the thing is is I guess on audiobook you have the choice to listen to this book with Chris as a male voice or as a female voice. Is that right. correct? That's correct, yes. Uh, which is really cool. So that's going to maybe change your perception too. I think the reason I don't feel totally bad, first of all, I love that Chris is not gendered in the book. Amazing. Two thumbs up. But um, all the other characters are gendered. So I feel like in some weird lizard, you know, socially ingrained part of my brain for better or for worse i automatically assigned a gender to chris spelled c-h-r-i-s which is how i'm personally used to seeing um people identify as male spell chris as male because everyone else was assigned something so it's kind of weird that mine and yours and probably other people's brains auto completed that but i do think that it's very special what he was trying to do with that character and I think that this is one of those situations where our rule of avoiding reviews and avoiding information when it comes to different books actually served us poorly. I agree. Um, it's, you know, everything's a learning experience. I applaud John Scalzi for his decision. And I want to read more books that are like that. I think it's incredible. So thank you guys for joining us. We appreciate you listening to us talk about Furyborn, about the rule prints, about Scott's car, and about Head On. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Sandra. And as always, we encourage you to keep reading past your bedtime. Mm -hmm.